Welcome, everybody. Good to see so many beautiful faces here. Welcome to the launch of musics, Musings on Perimenopause and Menopause, Identity, Experience, Transition, published by Demeter Press. Thanks to our viewers for joining us and to our bookstore partners, Owl's Nest Books in Calgary, Alberta, and Laughing Oyster Bookshop in Courtney, BC. <clears throat> My name is Yvonne, and I'm here to support Laura and Heather with the logistical pieces of the event. As your event techie, I'll be spotlighting the different individuals who are speaking tonight, so they should be front and center on your screen. However, if for some reason that is, uh, that's not the case, you can click on the view bot button in the top right corner of your screen and put it on speaker view. Only do this if the panel and host of this event don't show up on your main screen when they're speaking. If you have a question, we will have a Q&A time towards the end of this event. You can put questions in the chat by using hashtag question in capital letters and send it to Ali Bryan. And when you go to the chat to the right of the word two, there is a drop down menu and you can select Ali Bryan so she will directly receive your questions. These events will be recorded and will be posted on YouTube at a later time. And it's now my honor and pleasure to introduce to you your host for tonight, Ali Bryan. Ali Bryan is an award-winning novelist and creative nonfiction writer who explores the what ifs, the WTFs, and the wait a minutes of every day. She lives in the foothills of the Canadian Rockies, where she has a wrestling room in her garage and regularly gets choked out by her family. Perimenopause is her next adventure. Take it away, Ali. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction and welcome everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to host the official launch of Musings on Perimenopause and Menopause, Identity, Experience, and Transition. And I'm going to start uh, this evening with a land <clears throat> acknowledgement. So in the spirit of reconcilia reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, play, write, and transition on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Ghana, Pekani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes on, in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We further acknowledge the lands of the First Peoples represented by our viewers who are joining us this evening from all over the world. And in this time of national grief, we especially acknowledge the victims of Canada's residential school system and remember the children who were denied the opportunity to transition into adulthood and the intergenerational trauma that presides today. I'm very pleased to introduce your co-editors, Heather Dillaway and Laura Wurschler. Heather Dillaway is a professor of sociology and associate dean in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Her research focuses on women's perimenopause and menopause experiences and is published in a range of feminist journals, including Gender and Society, Sex Roles, Journal of Women in Aging, Healthcare for Women International, and Feminist Formations. Heather's work on the reproductive transition, as well as her research into the reproductive health experiences of women with physical disabilities, seeks to highlight women's everyday voices and lived experience. So please welcome Heather Dillaway. And secondly, we have Laura Wurschler. Laura discovered a love for editing while earning a certificate in journalism 10 years ago from Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, where she lives. She brings to her editing and writing decades of experience as a menstrual, sexual, and reproductive health advocate, commentator, and educator. Her work has appeared in various newspapers, journals, online media, and the anthologies Without Apology, Writings on Abortion in Canada, and the just published and fabulous book, You Look Good for Your Age, a collection about women and ageism. A creative nonfiction narrative from her work in progress about her role as advocate and companion to her mother in deep old age will appear in another anthology, anthology to be published this fall. So there seems to be an influx of literature and texts and research papers and articles on menopause that I keep seeing pop up in my social media feeds. And I'm not sure if that's because Facebook figured out that I was hosting this launch or if it has somehow got into my Google search history and has seen that I've been Googling things like jumpsuits for women over 40 or 
Um, you know, where can I buy a skateboard in Calgary, which reminds me of someone who talked about, uh, you know, going back and trying things from their youth. And so I couldn't tell if we're just in a prime time to be talking about menopause and it's finally uh, becoming much more part of the conversation. Or again, if this is my own uh, Google search history that has made all these menopause books um, pop up. But what I really, really liked about this particular book um, is, is of course the scope and the variety of the content. Um, It is an academic anthology But the personal narratives, the art, the film analyses, uh, the poetry, the reflections, they offer such a larger story. So Heather, can I assume that was your intent? And and why was that your intent in um, telling the story of perimenopause and menopause in a way that I don't see in all these other books that keep popping up on my timeline? Yeah, so thank you, Ali, uh, for hosting this. And um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining Um, Yeah, so, you know, I've been researching menopause and perimenopause for about 20 years. And before that, I I was researching other reproductive health experiences like breastfeeding and pregnancy and childbirth. And um, I think that over time, I've realized that social scientists like me and humanities scholars, women's health scholars, um, can can curate and organize women's voices in our work uh, a lot, but sometimes we can't get the full picture in the work that we publish. And so for me, this uh, proposing this anthology with Demeter Press was, was important because uh, it would allow us to include both sort of the research pieces that that maybe we've been working on for uh, for decades, but also the our personal reflections that would really speak to how complicated any life stage really is, and how complicated the life uh, the re- reproductive life course is. Um, so that that was the goal, and I, I very much meant from the beginning to include the poetry and the personal reflective pieces and the research pieces side by side because I think together they tell more of a full story. Absolutely. And and that's another thing I really liked about a book is its structure and how you were able to organize it uh, into four themes. So of course there's the menotypical, where and women react in both conventional and unconventional ways to the typical talking points and issues of concern about the menopausal transition. Uh, The next theme is out of step, when the transition to menopause does not happen at the age or in the way it's expected to happen. Uh, The third theme, blood relations, where in relationships of various kinds, mother and daughter, woman and partner, woman helping woman, influence, perception, identity, decision-making, and the sense of community throughout the transition to menopause. And of course, the fourth and final uh, section, unleashed, where in women sees the freedom to be, to create, to push boundaries, and to disengage from expectations societal norms and assumptions about the aging reproductive body. And so Laura, I was wondering when the submissions started to roll in, did they naturally naturally sort of fall into these categories? Did they sort of, did the themes sort of present themselves or did you go into this collection thinking you were going to, you know, fit the work into these categories? How did those themes evolve? They very much evolved. There was no clear picture at the beginning how they were going to fit together. And my the two charts that I started with with the editing were research papers and more narrative artistic parts and and I kept them separate in that regard but it became clear that that wasn't going to work and after working with the contributors and working with all of the ideas that were being presented they did tend to fall into these these loose categories of of theme that that seemed to work. And the menotypical idea came to me because um, there were pieces that were a little bit more straightforward in terms of, of what they were talking about. But even within that first theme, mm-hmm. um, there's, a, there's a cartoon with captions and there's a personal research paper and a research papers, there was still all this variety. And of course, I think anyone who puts together an anthology or collection would know that any piece might fit in one or two. But it was, it was, I thought at first it would be a very difficult thing, but when the 
when it started to fall into place, I was very pleased with how the pieces um, fit neatly, nicely into these categories. Well, let's talk about that first category, the, the menotypical. Um, of course, you know, before I even opened the book, I immediately started to think of, of what I had thought about menopause and the experiences that I could look back on and think, you know, that what we see sort of in pop culture, um, or just again, in my own life. And I remember, you know, flying across the country one time with my infant. And of course we were seated early as they let you board with small children. I thought, oh, you know, who's going to get stuck with, with me and the baby, you know, in the middle seat and lo, lo and behold, it's this couple. And, and this woman is having a hot flash before we even started taxiing down the runway. And I thought, okay, that's a menotypical thing. We, we hear about hot flashes all the time. And then last couple of years ago, I was teaching a course and a woman showed up late um, to one of my writing courses and she blamed it later on, um, on her menopause brain, her menopause mind, which at the time I didn't quite know what she meant by that, but I will never forget the look on her face because it, it quite literally looked like she had been dropped down from another planet from outer space into this classroom. And she just looked so discombobulated. And I thought, okay, this, this is another one of those things that, you know, I've, I've heard women talk about and then to see it happen. Um, was so interesting. And then the, the final thing that stuck out for me was, of course, uh, Fried Green Tomatoes, the movie starring Kathy Bates, which I was probably a teenager or a young teen at the time. And I'll you know never forget the scene. I think most of us, if you're familiar with that movie, remember the scene where uh, Kathy Bates' character, Evelyn, you know, shows up into a, a parking lot and she's trying to get um, get a spot. And you know, this, this, these two young women in a fancy sports car pull into the spot in front of her. And she says, you know, Hey, I was waiting for that spot. And she says, face it lady, we're younger and faster. And of course, Evelyn then rear ends the car <laughs> and uh, the girl screams, what are you doing? And she said, are you, the other one says, are you crazy? And uh, Evelyn says, face it girls, I'm older and I have more insurance. So those are just three examples of very metatypical, what I would have thought um, menopause seemed like. And I don't think I had seen or read or witnessed anything outside of that, um, which just speaks to the importance of this anthology because it takes it beyond that single narrative. Um, and on that note, I would love to introduce our first reader um, reflecting on this theme. And that is Joanne Gilbert. So Joanne's going to unmute. Joanne is the Charles A. Dana Professor Emerita of Communication and New Media Studies at Alma College in Michigan. Her work on humor, advocacy, and the discourse of marginalized voices has appeared in many journals and publications. And Joanne Gilbert will be reading from her poem, Slouching Towards Menopause. Please welcome Joanne. Slouching towards <laughs> menopause. <laughs> I wasn't glad to see you after almost a year of living without you. Your return, unbidden, unwanted, unhinged me as I scrambled to find my mooring, sought what had become my equilibrium. The worst part was not knowing whether you would stay or go, only to return. Again, I thought I was done with you for good. Hoped I was, made plans for a better life without you. Anticipated the time I could truly celebrate your departure. Dared not speak of finality, but prayed daily that you would never darken my door. And now the balance I'd begun to achieve recedes as I struggle with the chaos of uncertainty. Thank you, Joanne. The chaos of uncertainty, that seems to be a theme <laughs> throughout this entire book. Um, a beautiful reading, um, just even the title, Slouching Towards Menopause. Um, this whole section is, is fascinating to me because, again, even though they are menotypical responses, 
it doesn't mean they're all received in that same sort of negative connotation or the negative light that they're often portrayed. And I kind of really liked, I appreciated, I guess, that little twist on these sort of more common narratives that, you know, it's not the end of the world to have a hot flash. No one actually died of having one. Um, you know, we see in Joanne's work here and in many of the pieces throughout the, the section, that uh, humor is often used as a way to manage um, the female experience, isn't it? With everything, whether that's you know menstruation, pregnancy, all of the the other kind of female uh, changes and transitions along the way. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Laura and Heather, on this sort of the menotypical experience that even within the framework of what we think we know, it's not always perceived as a negative, as some of these pieces showed. For sure, it's not always perceived as a negative. And, and one of the things I stated in, in the introduction was that um, the same story will be perceived negatively or positively by different readers. So I think this is one of the key elements is that, that even with these typical menotypical exper menopausal experiences, the experience of them can be very different across borders. But but I want Heather to also address this whole concept of the master narrative that, mm -hmm. that we create around um, the menopause, which you kind of explained with your anecdotes at the beginning. Yeah, so I think this first section uh, recognizes that even if in the end, uh, symptoms, bodily signs, experiences and identities at this life stage aren't negative, we do learn that there are certain markers that we have moved beyond reproductive capabilities or are about to, and things like hot flashes, heavy bleeding, um, just becoming more invisible as women, as we age, um, it's certain things about our bodies signify that we are moving past something and, and uh, a master narrative or sort of the constructions of, uh, of us in those moments are more negative than positive. And so we do have a choice to sort of pivot and to define ourselves differently over time. But the initial impression we sometimes have is um, that we are jarred by what we're experiencing or we are not ready for it or it is negative in experience until it isn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what this section uh, gets at. And I, and I, I think that all of the pieces, regardless of the, re, of re, whether they're more research oriented or personal reflections, they all sort of hit on this sort of a theme that, that at first something might appear negative, even if later on it might not be. Yeah. And I think jarring is really the right word to describe this sort of early transition, um, you know, as someone who ha is maybe on the cusp of perimenopause. And now that I've read this book, I'm like, oh God, I'm fully in <laughs> perimenopause. This is, you know, it's, you know, it's given me a different framework to view sort of where I'm at, at the age of 42. Um, but it, it's fascinating because, you know, as someone who has three children and, and just feels like they've gone, gone, gone all the time, it's almost like you just get this little tiny window where, you know, I feel like I just was able to sit down and breathe, you know, with having children that are older and a little bit more independent. And then it's like, nope, we're not done. We're, we're transitioning again. So um, yeah, it's, it's a very peculiar time for me being at the, the very beginning. Uh, I feel like I'm oscillating between, you know, do I still need to put the effort in? Like, do I should, is, do I need to bother being sexy or should I just like throw it all out and, you know, put on a, a garbage bag and just, you know, and in some ways I feel I'd be content to just do that. And then there's the other part of me that's like, no, it's not over yet. So um, yeah, I, I loved this section that it, it is jarring um, at first, but it's, there's so many ways to navigate it once we know we're in it. And I think that's the, the beauty of this anthology coming at it from um, being at the beginning is, is to have some, um, a viewpoint, you know, to look ahead, as opposed to so often with women's issues, we are looking back, it's only through hindsight that we understand what is happening to us. Um, I'd like to move on unless there's any other comments from either of you. I was just going to add one more thing. One of the papers is a is a research paper, but it's also a personal narrative about a, a, a sociologist who was involved is is involved in, in a 
long American longitudinal mm -hmm. study on women's health across the nation, the SWAN study. And what's interesting about that is even though it touches on all these menotypical bits, it's also taking into account race, gender, and identity as they relate to menopause so that they're even within the menotypical researchers are even trying to expand the breadth with which they understand um, the experience. So just another point about how there's all this crossover between what's going on. Yeah. And that was fascinating too, just to see, you know, how different cultures perceived it or different geographies, uh, different class, different ethnicities. Um, the, the approach in some cases, yes, there was crossover and some that was almost like they were going through menopause in a totally different way, which made me really wonder about how many of those narratives had been constructed, you know, through society and what we, you know, how many things we, we just sort of expected to happen to us because that's what we had been seeing sort of through, through like a North American lens. Um, so really eye opening to, to know, because sometimes, you know, if you do meet that odd woman who doesn't describe having hot flashes, you think they're sort of anomaly when you, when you actually read the research presented in that particular piece, there's lots of people that didn't experience those symptoms. And so, yeah, I, I really appreciated the, uh, the look, the, the cultural, cultural lens that piece offered. The only uh, other thing I would say real quickly before we move on <laughs> is that I think this section starts to highlight how um, we don't, we don't have to be invisible at this life stage and, and that we can talk about some of these symptoms more publicly and that we don't have to be the gone girl that uh, Mary J. Lumpton uh, Jane Lupton says that, that, that this this is a a very visible and public uh, you know transition that we make and and we would and that that's something that we should recognize. And I also love that it it can be it's personal too. Like there's there's some people that will almost retreat for some time as they sort of navigate and sort of figure it out. Um, but we are seeing much more of it happening kind of in public and people being less ashamed. And, and, you know, when I was doing some research on sort of where some of these narratives might've come from, and of course they're from a patriarchal lens, you know, no wonder we, we didn't talk about these things because it was horrific. Um, and I, I'll read a quote later on because I do want to move on to the next section because for me, it was also uh, just critical because I feel like it's a part of the menopause or the perimenopause pause journey that's often left out, which is, what happens when it doesn't happen as expected. Um, so this section of course is called out of step. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, what, what was sort of horrifying about this section was not necessarily the diagnoses. It was that many women facing menopause at a time where they did not expect it. They, there was so much advocacy and so much uncertainty and so much uh, just such a lack of support. So it's like on top of these transitions that they're already kind of manage managing biologically and medically and, and psychologically, um, they're also, you know, so many people found themselves having to constantly advocate and seek, you know, advice and support from multiple, you know, sources and doctors before they were really able to get uh, the appropriate support. So that was, um, you know, and I, I think that is true of, of a lot of women's health and women's issue. We know what the statistics are in terms of women being seen and heard and listened to and women's health problems, you know, are usually kind of at the bottom of the barrel. But um, I, I just found that particularly difficult when you look at the way the intersex community, for example, has been challenged by menopause. It was, it was really outrageous. And on that note, I would like to introduce our next reader to discuss this theme of menopause and when it happens out of step. And I'm going to introduce to you Georgianne Davis. Georgianne Davis is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Her work is at the intersection of sociology of diagnosis and feminist theory. So please welcome Georgianne. Hello, thank you. Um, it's really my honor to read this piece that's been was co-authored with a sociologist by the name of Koel Khan. Menopause often marks a transition in a woman's life, as it did for me, George Ann. Only I was a teenager when doctors surgically shaped my body, leaving me in what they labeled post-surgical menopause. I was born intersex, but like other intersex people, I wasn't told the truth when I was diagnosed. 
Instead, I was told I had malignant ovaries that needed to be removed. I have a vagina, but instead of XX chromosomes, ovaries, fallopian tubes, and a uterus, I have XY chromosomes and testes. Well, that is until doctors surgically, surgically remove them because a girl isn't supposed to have them. In this paper, sociologist Quell Khan and I collaborate to draw on the intersex experience, specifically my experience to offer a blended autoethnographic and life history account that exemplifies how, like menstruation, menopause is socially constructed. When we say menopause is socially constructed, we are not denying that many females will experience a time in their life when their period ends, nor are we suggested that peri or postmenopausal experiences such as hot flashes are fictions of one's imagination. As critical feminists, we don't feel it is our place to challenge biological processes or question lived experiences. Rather, building on work that sees menopause in relation to its medicalization and its feminist challenges, we rely on an intersex experience to show how doctors draw on and reconstruct their definition of menopause to control who can experience it. This power over menopause lets doctors who treat intersex people leverage their authority over biological processes while at the same time minimizing how they violate human rights when they perform medically unnecessary and irreversible interventions on intersex people's bodies. We begin our discussion with a brief overview of intersex to make the case that it is not unusual for doctors to reframe diagnoses in this case, menopause, to fit a narrative that they are constructing. We then turn to a discussion of how doctors have historically and horrifically treated intersex people. My experience, just one example of how doctors lie to intersex people about their diagnosis out of fear that knowing the truth would disrupt the development of an intersex person's gender identity. Next, we describe what it was like for me to navigate menopause without ever experiencing a period. We explain how many intersex people are strongly compelled by their doctors to buy expensive hormone replacement therapy patches not covered by health insurance rather than pads from the product aisle of their local grocery store. Many intersex people also fa face difficulty in finding the right hormonal balance for their body, leaving a number of them, myself included, altogether rejecting hormone therapy. We conclude that the intersex experience highlighted here is a prime example of how menopause is a socially constructed phenomenon. Many intersex women never experience periods, yet is part of the powerful medical institution. Doctors wrongly tell us that they are in or we are in post-surgical menopause. Thank you. And what really struck me about that, Georgianne, was, was the, <clears throat> the part where you were basically told you had ovarian cysts, but they weren't going to remove them for a few years. And that, of course, as a teenager, that wouldn't necessarily be something you would clue into. But of course, if that was actually the case, they would remove them right away. Why would they let, you know, malignant uh, ovaries stay? So um, I, I thank you for sharing this piece. And, I, and I'm glad to see it included in a collection about menopause, because if someone had told me before I read this, that menopause was a socially constructed thing, I would have said, hmm wouldn't have understood that. Um, and it's, we cannot talk about menopause if we don't talk about when it happens outside of the scope of what we, we think or that menotypical experience. Um, can you expand a little bit on that, Heather? Um, the, these stories, you know, you know, Georgianne had that, the, the experience from the, the, an intersex person's point of view, um, but there was also teenagers that were going through menopause at the same time as their mothers. And that was quite a harrowing piece to read because again, the uncertainty around the diagnosis and the, the lack of support um, just shows cause for why we need to have these conversations because it was almost as if, well, I think one of the pieces kind of joked about how the mother was like, oh, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought you were going through menopause to your teenage daughter. And that was really quite fascinating and, and terrifying, I think, as a parent to, to have to navigate that. Yeah, so I really like this section of the book, uh, and and I'm really glad that um, George Ann could actually read this piece because it really does show 
how much we sort of define life stages um, through time and assume that certain things happen at the, uh, certain times or life stages. And, um, but when we really think about women's health, things happen in varying ways. And um, we can't even say that menstruation happens the same way for, uh, for everyone, uh, pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, menopause, any kind of process um, that would count as reproductive. People even respond differently to birth control. So, so there, uh, I think this section really drives home that um, because of the way we, we culturally define certain stages of, of the life, life process, certain experiences feel like they're coming at the wrong time, they're coming at the wrong life stage, they're off tempo, they're, and, and uh, we feel out of control, we feel like we're waiting, we feel like uh, we are the ones that, uh, that are, are not right, when actually there's more variability that we need to acknowledge. So this is purposely located right after the menotypical section because, you know, especially pieces like George Ann's, it, uh, you know, you can tell that medicine doctors are getting to define uh, her experience more than she's able to, to define it. And at the same time, cultural constructions of menopause as only happening at a certain period in a life mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, at the same time, make it difficult to, to figure out what's happening um, in an individual life. So, so I really think all of these pieces together uh, drive home the fact that we, we have to think of, of reproductive aging, perimenopause, menopause, just different moments of the life course as way more variable than, than maybe we let on on a daily basis. And I think again, it, it's it's just missing from from just basic conversation. And it's not until something happens to your friend, you know, and it's like all of a sudden they have, you know, they're not they're missing their period, but they're too young for menopause, as they are told, you know, when they initially go into the doctor. Well, it can't be that because you're only 38. And so then it's like they're told that periods are irregular and to go home. And then, you know, six months later, they're back and it's, it's this, and it's that. And, you know, I, I, there's so many women around me that have gone through that, including my own daughter with her issues with menstruation that, you know, I'm finding that you, you have to be an advocate. You have to ask the questions. You have to put um, these issues, reproductive issues um, at the forefront of almost every conversation you have when you go in to visit a doctor, because, we, there's just, there's still so much information out there. There's still more to learn. Um, and again, it's this, I think, I think women learn. I mean, my daughter at 16 has already learned that she will have to advocate for her body and for her health, her sexual health or reproductive health in order to make sure that she gets the answers because it's so easily blown off if not. And I just can't imagine, you know, it, it's horrific what, what we see medical doctors doing to intersex bodies um, but also sort of downplaying or not recognizing that, you know, the complexity, I guess, of all of these things. I, I think that the point of, of this section in a way is that by pushing us to the boundaries of perimenopausal and menopausal experience, whether it be completely socially constructed as it is for Georgianne or happens before the age of 40 or even younger for the young women experiencing primary ovarian insufficiency, um, is that it reminds us that between those, what we might call way atypical experiences and the menotypical is this broad range that Heather mentioned. So we, we, we make the point that we have to broaden the menopausal discourse to include all of these variations from the, for the more minor ones that, that we might not think is that odd, all the way to the full end of the spectrum. And then we've got the voices that aren't in this section, the voices of transgendered people, both transgendered men and women whose experiences with the menopause is, is not fully understood or, um, or explored to the point where we need to learn more about how, how those experiences unfold. So what we, we called it out of step, but the point is, is 
let's bring it into step. Let's bring mm -hmm. it into the a broader framework that will include everyone's experiences. Yeah, it, it made me start to think, you know, um, you know, just about about language and assumptions that I have probably incorrectly made over the years, assuming that someone wouldn't, you know, go into menopause until a later time at life. And, and, you know, hearing some of these personal narratives and the the discomfort of, you know, people talking about pregnancy and stuff when other people are have already gone through that transition was was quite eye opening. Um, so I, I'm, yes, I think it's, it's critical. And, and again, like you said, I think we haven't even begun to explore um, how this affects the trans trans community. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a wealth of research that will come out in the next and you know, and there is a new book out by Heather Karina called What Fresh Hell Is This that <sighs> makes a, 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 a point of really making sure that those voices and their experiences are included. So, mm -hmm. you know, with with all the work that's being done in this area, we're we're getting to the to the we're getting into the nitty gritty of all these experiences, which is mm -hmm. great to see. And broadening that scope, which was, again, the point of this this anthology from the first place. Um, the next section, the next theme on, on bloodlines, um, I, I love the balance in this section because we've got, you know, Heather, yourself included, your, your piece on, you know, tracking your, your period and then not getting your period alongside your, your young daughter and, um, you know, the partner, the, the spousal thing was, was fascinating to me. And, and then just this sort of community of, you know, women looking for sort of support and community through things like blogs and Facebook groups. And, you know, one of the things I notice as a parent is, uh, I find women are very active and have no problem talking about, you know, pregnancy, you know, there's, you know, gazillion pregnancy blogs and there's a gazillion support groups for women with young children but it's kind of like once we get past that point where they're you know they're weaned and they're sleeping through the night we don't really talk about women's issues anymore or transition and you know it's almost like you don't know this stuff is out there until you go creeping around the internet to find it and I found that kind of strange that we, you know, we, we celebrate this kind of time of birth and, and our reproductive health and when we're fertile, and then we just kind of disappear and, and it's not really talked about again. And so uh, this section I thought was, was really beautiful, actually, in terms of looking at the various types of relationships and where people, where women are finding community when they can't find it close to home or they can't find it within their culture or they don't have parents even or you know or or women in their family to talk talk to about these issues or as it is in some families whether it's cultural or not these are things that are just not talked about yeah, there's um, a lot of searching for um for somebody who understands as that as the name is the one piece about Julian Anderson's piece about the the community the perimenopausal blog dear magnolia mm -hmm. nobody really understands and so mm -hmm. we do have to go out and find other sources or dig deeply within mm -hmm. as so, and, and again when these experiences are so varied you know, if you, if you're, if you're not in the menotypical or if you're atypical, or if you just have your, your own bizarre set of, of symptoms, um, you know, reaching out and finding community and saying, okay, at least I know I'm not going crazy seem to be one of the themes right. that kept coming up through this section and, and through those blogs is I'm not crazy. Um, so on that note, we're going to introduce our next reader, Marie McCanio. Read Marie's file here. Marie McCanio is a retired psychotherapist who, through her company, Adventures in Writing, helps aspiring women writers find their inner voice. She lives in Courtney, British Columbia, and she will be reading from a personal essay called Finding Bedrock. Thank you. As a 40-something, I imagined I would sail through perimenopause to menopause without the many symptoms I'd heard and read about. One of my writing mentors uses an exercise that starts with a sentence stem, tell me everything you know about blank. If I'd filled in the blank with the word menopause prior to my lived experience, I would have written something like this. Menopause is overblown in our culture. I've been looking after my body well and my alternative medical support has been proactive, preparing my body for changes coming soon. I'm not likely to have many symptoms. 
I believe that menopause is a myth that allopathic medical system has made up to medicalize a natural female process. Now, looking back 12 years after reaching menopause, what I would write is this shit is real. <laughs> the experience was not just about the physical changes, the weight gain, the mood swings and the hot flashes. Exploring questions about gender and life purpose as a woman, along with deep seated creative desires clamoring for attention required intense emotional labor. From my 60 something perspective, I now realize the revolution I experienced went far be beyond hot flashes and dry vaginas. For me, perimenopause triggered the renovation of personal relationships, dramatically changing how I chose to be a partner in my marriage and mother to my now adult children. Most profound was how it transformed my relationship with myself. In the couple of years prior to full menopause, I resolved to fulfill a dream, to walk the Camino de Santiago in Northern Spain. My husband and adult son would accompany me. As I prepared for our pilgrimage, I was also in the midst of examining my relationship with my husband, wondering about the future of my marriage. During my Camino journey, I had many opportunities for self-reflection the long hours of putting one foot in front of another leading to deep meditative states. Upon my return to Canada, I committed to my long simmering desire to write. As my words flowed onto the pages, I realized I was crafting a memoir about my Camino journey. Important themes emerged that had been unleashed by the walk. I proceeded one sentence, one paragraph, one page at a time until I had a finished manuscript. The publication of my memoir, The Chocolate Pilgrim, A Journey to Self-Discovery and Transformation on the Camino de Santiago, was a culmination of resolution, healing, and self-confidence. From reading I have done since those unsettled years of questioning my self-identity and personal relationships, I've discovered that I was responding to a call that many women answered during this major transition, an invitation to live more truthfully, aligned with our innermost impulses, beliefs, and desires. Christiane Northrup writes about this call to action in the wisdom of menopause. The primary relationship that needs updating at midlife is the one you have with yourself. All other interpersonal crises that arrive at this time are simply reflections of this. What's really going on is that the new self you're becoming is no longer willing to accept less than she deserves or is capable of receiving from others. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. I love this, this piece and this section and this idea that it's not just about our relationships with other people. It's about the relationship with ourself and sort of reconciling uh, who we are through this experience. And a couple of years ago, before I was even sort of thinking about perimenopause, when I'm still, you know, preparing lunches and driving children places and doing a thousand loads of laundry, I read an article, I think it was in the Atlantic, and it, it was talking about the number of women in their 50s who were leaving their longtime marriages or their partners um, for this sort of reason. And that sometimes, you know, marriage is the cost of this sort of transition. And I thought it was so peculiar because I said in a lot of cases, the husbands, and this, these were most were mostly heterosexual couples that were discussed in this particular article, you know, just kind of thought the menopause would wear off or, or kind of go away or that it wasn't, I don't think they appreciated the, the magnitude of what the transition was. And it goes back to those sort of stereotypes of it being just a sort of biological process where the period stops the vagina gets dry, there's some hot flashes, you know, so I, I found this sort of whole kind of reckoning of the self, um, not a part of the, the menopause conversation I had ever kind of known about. Um, so what is it about, or I would have looked at these two things as separately, I would have looked at menopause as a thing. And then I would have looked at what I would have thought as a midlife crisis. Where's the connection between these two things? Good question. 
So I would say that um, Anne Barrett, one of our uh, our contributors at the very end of the book, not in this section, but could have been in this section. Hmm. Um, she she talks about how existence is becoming, not being, um, and how the reproductive uh, we are caught in the midst of reproductive life cycles at the same time as being uh, uh, in the midst of larger, much broader life cycles, and th 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 they're connected. Right. And and, um, you know, we arrive at midlife and we've lived long enough and have experienced enough life stages um, or we are, we are looking ahead. Right. At life stages. Um, and and we are sort of being recursive, being reflective on where we sit um, and and we do that with other people right, within the relationships that we have and within the past and, and maybe what we think is the future. Um, so so we, we find ourselves um, at, at a, a time when we really can reflect on what's happened already and what, what can happen in the, in the future and kind of where we sit in these life cycles. Yeah, and I think it really speaks to one of the key elements that we uh, uh, address in the in the conclusion, and that is the transformative power mm -hmm. of this transition. Because, in many ways, when you're forging a new relationship with yourself, you're also forging a new identity. You know, who am I going to be in this next phase of my life? Do I want to change careers? Do I want to leave my partnership? Um, so we identities and the identities and experience of other people that we are engaged with also help us understand our own. Um, and I think, I think really any menopause story in some realm is about relationship. It's about redefining relationships or reforming them. So it, you know, it, it works between mother, daughter, daughter, mother, as Heather's and my stories in the book, attest to it also happens between strangers who find each other on the internet it happens between partners and it definitely most definitely happens with ourselves. yeah it, again it's it's just part of the sort of menopause experience I, I I didn't know was part of menopause I you know you can't because again I would have thought of it more as the the midlife crisis not seeing that it was maybe attached or linked or closely related to uh, to the, the transition of, of sort of the body and, you know, their reproductive um, health or transition of, of women. And then I kind of, it kind of, but it was kind of sad too, that like, are we, is it menopause that is triggering these sort of reactions or, or it, are, you know, are these things we should be doing before we reach menopause? And that's what I also found really interesting. And, and again, some of it is, you know, you can't, you, you, you just, you can't, you're, you're busy. Life goes on. You're in that, you know, that kind of busy time of life. And like I said, you're all of a sudden in that chair, you have a second to breathe and you're on to the next transition, but yeah, a really wonderful, beautiful section about kind of community and, and where we might find it. And it's not always in our house. It might not be the partner lying next to us, which is not always a bad thing either. It's because there are other supports. And I think we're seeing more, um, groups evolve and more talk and it's becoming a little bit more part of the the narrative and we're it's being it's coming out from the woodwork and that's I think a really positive thing for women we have one more section and um it is called unleashed and I am going to invite our fourth and final reading to uh reader tonight introducing Kayo Gamber she will be reading all new panties Kayo Gamber is an associate professor of writing in women's gender and, and sexuality studies at George Washington University. Among her many publications are essays about the way cultural artifacts such as advertisements for menstrual products or the Barbie doll are implicated in the creation of Western notions of girlhood and womanhood. Please welcome Kayo Gamber. Hi, I'm just gonna start. I was always a big girl and today I'm an older, big woman. When I was a big girl, I could fit the biggest size of underwear available at the store, the L or large underwear. 
I feared outgrowing L as there weren't extra large sizes widely marketed at that time. I was relieved that I could fit my L underwear when I wore a thick menstrual pad attached to an awkward menstrual belt. In fact, if the panties were a bit snug with the thick pad, that was, that was fine because the almost too tight fit helped to keep the pad in place. Nonetheless, there always were accidents. I was a sanitary pad girl, then woman. As a result, I learned to wear black pants. In fact, now I always wear black pants. Even when choosing my wedding outfit, I said, I want to wear a tunic and black pants. My friends who were gathered said, no black pants on your wedding day. My partner and I married after 25 years together when gay marriage finally was legalized in the United States. Things went awry with my wedding outfit and in the end, I wore a tunic with black pants. It seemed fitting. I firmly believe when things go awry, whether with menstrual accidents or wardrobe malfunctions, black pants are always a welcoming and forgiving sartorial choice. As a middle-aged and then older woman, I have worn what my wife and I call work panties. No high cut, no lace, no strings, no thongs, no cutouts. All of my briefs are now extra, extra, extra large in size, comfortable and cotton. For many years, these underwear were uninspired. They came in packets of three colors, white, black, and something called nude. This was the primary reason we called them work panties. They didn't inspire one to feel playful or sexy. You could choose the white or nude if you were wearing light colored clothes and didn't want the color of your underwear to show through. The limited choices meant that you were just wearing very sensible panties that seemed to start just below your breasts and crested at the top of your thighs. For years, my work panties were stained. It was difficult to invest in new underwear when they too would just become stained. Thus, I looked forward to menopause because I decided that once menses was safely behind me, I would buy all new underwear and not have to worry about any more stains. Once menopause was assured, I went online and discovered to my delight that the choices for women had changed over the years. I spent two hours shopping for underwear. In the end, I still bought 100% cotton briefs, but I was able to find underwear that had fun designs Mondrian squares, Kandinsky colorful compositions, prosaic plaids, pastels and fluorescents, even a Hello Kitty, which I loved for the implied double entendre. <laughs> Thank you, Kao. Um, I guess a question for our two hosts before we open it up to the floor for a Q&A. What does unleashed mean to you both? Well, I think some of the things I said was women become unleashed from expectations and societal norms and assumptions about the aging reproductive body. You know, they, they, they seize this freedom to go out and create and experience the world in a different way. And, you know, uh, this is so well expressed by our contributor, Magalie, who writes a piece called Finding Poetry at 50. And basically said the fresh perspectives thrust upon her upon menopause unleashed po her poetic soul. So I think this, this sense that there may be something about ourselves to discover throughout this transition that unleashes parts of ourselves that we don't even know exist or that have yet to be nurtured is kind of where it came from for me. What about you, Heather? Yeah, so for me, I mean, part of it is about unhinging from those master narratives that we talked about in the in the beginning, um, and really making sure that women themselves get to define what this life stage is like at, in the end, regardless of when it uh, whether it's mistimed, jarring, surprising, sudden, 
or not, right? Um, and also um, one of our other contributors, Sylvie Tele uh, Gambato, she talks about how it's about recapturing the livability <laughs> of this life stage. Um, and she talks about how a lot of our narratives about this, uh, this kind of life, uh, life stage make it sound like uh, perimenopause and menopause and beyond are sort of unlivable, uninhabitable, um, and unfriendly. And I think it's about sort of getting to the point where you can move past uh, that and maybe past confusion and uncertainty and actually live whatever life you're going to live at this life stage. Wonderful. And we have our first question from Sandra Hayes Gardner, who of course says, congratulations to you both. Um, she says that at age 73, uh, this book has given her more permission and awareness, um, which is wonderful to hear that at 73, there's, there's still so much more to be aware about. And this book certainly has, has helped enlighten many of us. Um, her question is, she would like to know um, from both of you, Lauren and Heather, what you might've learned that surprised you or that you did not know um, when you did all the reading and editing in this book, was there anything that, that surprised you or jumped out as a, a different experience or perspective that you hadn't considered before? I, I can start. I mean, I think that the commonalities across the pieces actually stood out to me from the very get-go. Um, as submissions rolled in and as we worked with this book for five years, um, and I think Laura can uh, say the same, um, you know, we, we ended up with uh, really a variety of pieces um, that didn't fit into one category or the, or the other that all talked about just the uncertainties, um, but the ability to come to some sort of, um, if not solace, sort of understanding uh, of, of um, this, this life stage and the, the, and the fact that it wasn't necessarily all about burden, even if burdens were part of it. Um, and that even if a, an experience was primarily negative, there was still some identity work that could actually become something different. Um, and I think that that theme really stood out for me. And for you, Laura, was there any surprises um, in reading the submissions and editing this um, anthology? Well, I think it's still resonating in an odd way. I, as you know, because you read my piece, I was very fortunate not to experience any real physical discomfort, anything that that caused me great distress, although I had sleepless nights and I had, um, you know, some very severe PMS, I suppose, but I realized that other things that I had experienced in that transitional period that I had not ascribed to perimenopause and menopause were in all likelihood part of that transition for me. So reading of these experiences of others helped me reframe the experience that I've already had. So I see it in a completely different light and, and it's taken the couple of years of editing and working with these pieces and these stories for me to kind of come to that realization. So I think if I were surprised by anything, that might be it. That's wonderful. Uh, any other questions? You can fire them away in the chat. The other thing I'll say just while we're waiting for questions is, um, you know, I've been struck over time about how when you ask uh, women to talk about perimenopause and menopause, they also talk about everything else too. Um, they talk about their families, they talk about partners, they talk about lack of partners, they talk about lack of children or child-free status, they talk about uh, wanting children, they talk about aging, they talk about work, they talk about doctors. And, uh, and so for me, talking about perimenopause and menopause is also just talking about life, right? It's, it's talking about motherhood. It's talking about uh, child-free status. It's talking about other reproductive health uh, stages as much as it is about perimenopause and menopause. So that's really important to me too. And I think it, it, I only learned that reading all of the pieces in this book. Um, 
and not doing some of the other research I'm doing. That, that's funny because that's, that's very much a similar takeaway for me is that it, you, again, I had always thought perimenopause and menopause. And in fact, we don't even really discuss perimenopause. You know, I don't even think that is part of the sort of conversation. It's more usually like, you know, I've got friends who have the trackers on the phone that show when, you know, how many days it's been since they had their last period. And that's kind of about it. No one really talks about what perimenopause is. So for me, that was one of the things that was really eye opening is that it's, it's this big thing and it's hard to even put in a box and it could, it can mean so many different things. Um, and like you said, Heather, it, it's, it encompasses so much more. You can't really just talk about the bodily changes or this transition without talking about all these other aspects of a woman's life. Like you said, family, career, purpose, um, you know, children, not having children, you know, and, and, and that I, I'd love to know more about the perspective of women who go through menopause, who didn't have children, because so much of the narrative is focused on this, you know, the reproductive phase and the having of children. And, you know, we see more and more women making the choice not to have children or putting it off later. So um, I think there's going to be some more interesting stuff to come out of, of those choices that women are making now. Um, I think that was another key element that I got from the book, from working with the pieces in the book, and even my own story to a certain extent, in that we don't really go through any of these rites of passage, if you want to call them that, alone. We, 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 we go through them collectively. And I think Anne Baird in that, in her piece, where she extrapolates Judy Chicago's The Birth Project hmm. to aging women and looks at the parallels between the two archetypes of mother and crone. What I took away from that piece was that motherhood is almost never seen as anything other than an individual experience. And yet if we embrace it as the collective experience, then the questions that Heather, that Heather posed, you know, to have children or not have children, can you have children? Can't you have children? If we understood that, that motherhood, for instance, was a collective experience that we were all part of motherhood, whether we have children or don't have children, then it would take away so much of the angst that we have around um, these potentialities that life offers us. I, I think that was another profound takeaway for me. Well, that segues nicely to um, Jane Usher's comment here and question. She says, negative perceptions of menopause are higher in premenopausal women. Many menopausal and postmenopausal women feel very happy and healthy, empowered in their lives. How can we cha challenge negative expectations and negative cultural discourses associated with menopausal women? Heather? Yeah. I was uh, just say one thing. Mm -hmm. The more you know before you go through it, the more likely you are to frame it in a way that's comfortable for you. And I think that is the benefit of the many new books that are coming out that are speaking to women in your age group. You're able, as you said before, able to look forward with knowledge mm -hmm. and not and not have to muddle through it all and then look backward. I'm glad to get this question from Jane Usher because uh, her contribution in the in the volume actually does speak to this a little bit. Um, it, you know, she and co-authors <laughs> interviewed premenopausal women, all right, and um, pre-perimenopausal women um, to see what their reactions were to menopause, and they were watching what perimenopausal and menopausal women were doing around them. And not all of them arrived at the negative uh, um, uh, perspectives, uh, perspectives of menopause, but they did acknowledge the negativity that surrounded it. I mean, I do think it's about, um, you know, perimenopausal and menopausal women not being those gone girls that Mary J. Lop and Jane Lupton talks about, that we really need to keep this in the public eye, keep talking about it. Um, and and really make sure that the the complicated, complex, both positive and negative um, 
nature of this transition is talked about. And um, to one of your points, Allie, uh, much earlier tonight um, about how it seems like there's a lot more stuff coming out on menopause and perimenopause now. And I think that, that the talk about it ebbs and flows with generations. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, as baby boomers at age out, finally of, men of menopause or perimenopause at least, um, Gen X, right? Gen X women are now in full-fledged perimenopause um, and maybe moving slightly beyond it in some cases. Um, and even millennials, right, are starting to pop up as perimenopausal. So I think it does have to do with just the generations um, and uh, that, that are experiencing it at the time. Um, and you can kind of track literature as and and just talk in pop culture um, by generation um, if you if you think about the years in which things pop up. Um, but it's it's about continuing to have the conversation and and making sure that women's voices really are heard and making sure that people know that that we really aren't those gone girls we are we 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 are we can be loud and tell a, and tell the story of what this is like and it, it's so hard because there's such discourse about aging in general and i think when it comes to you know as i start questioning aging and and considering where i'm at you know so much of the the negative negativity comes from other women. You know, it's, I, I walked into a store, I walked into Sephora to get my daughter something at Christmas. And, you know, right away they were like, you need to come over here and get the cream. And I was like, but do I need the cream? And then of course I went home and I'm like, do I need the cream? Like, is it, is it that bad? Do I need the cream? So it's, it's really, you know, this is why we need to have these conversations to normalize aging, normalize women's bodies, normalize reproductive changes and transitions, because, you know, it, it's just such a battle. And I, you know, it, I get invited to Botox parties. I went to the dentist last week to, you know, and they were like, well, they can give you some Botox. that will help you with your jaw. And I was like, okay. And she's, you know, this is really good. It will help you from clenching. And then she's like, and for a little extra, you can get them to pop a few in your forehead. And again, I'm thinking, God, like, why do we push this sort of narrative of having to be kind of youthful? And I mean, I'm like, I'm 42. Like, you know, in my day, Botox was for people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. And now I see people getting it in their 20s and 30s. So it's like, in some ways, I feel we've made progress. In other ways, I feel like we have regressed a little bit. Uh, another comment here in the in the box from Shauna O'Hearn. Um, love this discussion and work. I'm doing my PhD in health geography, looking at the experience of perimenopause in the work environment. That would be a lovely other direction to, to look at. My case study is with physiotherapists. It is fascinating to see the similar similarities in my research to the work today. Thank you for this great work. So kind of goes back to your point, Heather, about the commonalities. And that was one of the things that you took away from, from reading the submissions and putting together this anthology, though, as much as the stories were different, there were those, those commonalities. Any other further questions? Um, enter them into the chat box. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it back over to, to Laura and Heather for some closing comments, and then I will finish off with a few final thoughts. Let's see, just want to make sure I haven't missed anyone or any comments. I, I wrote down a quote, Heather, from the conclusion that you were you mostly wrote. Confusion and uncertainties arising from both physical and psychological disruptions are the means by which women pass through this life-defining stage to arrive at new identities and experience. experiences. Perhaps this means we need to consider that women's feelings of flux, duality, and uncertain are not only normal and natural, by ne but necessary during this reproductive transition. Um, you know, this idea that it's something we either can avoid or should avoid or do everything within our power to avoid isn't really isn't really realistic or, or even possible. Right, and sometimes it's thrust upon us, right? Mm -hmm. um, as evidenced from some of the pieces in the out of step um, part of the, the volume and George Ann spoke to that, you know, sometimes it's thrust upon us and we have to deal with those du dualities when we don't really need to yet. Um, but in other cases, they come sort of gradually and, and maybe we can re recognize them slowly. Yeah, I think that, that for me, one of the main 
takeaways after you know reading and working with all of these pieces and also with you Laura is just um, you know to sit with the complexity of this topic and and to let it wash over you and and to sort of acknowledge its negative parts especially initially maybe and then to ride through them um, and really realize the more positive or more transformative maybe if not positive um, you know parts of this transition you know almost regardless of when it comes and I think we hear that loud and and clear from most of the pieces in the book I just wanted to um, to close by by reading a few quotes and they're not from that long ago, which speaks to, you know, just how far we've come on this, on these discussions and the importance of this type of work, um, both the, the creative work, the, the personal narratives, the art, but also the continued research and study of, of women's transition and reproductive health on, on a much larger scale and broader scope. In 1969, David Rubin said, once the ovaries stop, the very essence of being a woman stops. Adding that the postmenopausal woman comes, quote, as close as she can to being a man. Or rather, not really a man, but no longer a functional woman. 1969, that wasn't that long ago. I continue. Sigmund Freud pronounced, it is well-known fact that after women have lost their genital function, their character often undergoes a peculiar alteration and they become quarrelsome, vexatious, and overbearing. And by the mid 20th century, the gynecologist Robert Wilson said, the unpalpable truth must be faced that all postmenopausal post women are castrates. So that wasn't that long ago. And this is why there's still an incredible amount of work to do. Um, when I first got this book, I was reading it, Heather, her, or sorry, Laura had sent me the PDF and then the book arrived and my, my nine-year-old daughter came up to me and she picked up the book and said, what's this about? And I said, and then she read the cover and she said, um, oh, menopause, isn't that thing, isn't that that thing when you're, when you stop getting your period and you go psycho? <laughs> So I laughed and then immediately I was horrified. I was thinking you're nine years old. How do you know this? Or what made you think that this is what menopause is about? And she said, well, you told me that. <laughs> so then I thought, oh my gosh, I'm spreading the same sort of lies. I am no different than these men who have been saying this for generations. She later clarified, I didn't use the word psycho but I had something had said something about um, losing her mind. Um, but what I, one of the quotes that I pulled from the book that I thought really summed up the experience, and I can't remember who it was from, um, but it was that it's a disorienting, exciting, and sad time. And I thought that really does sort of seem to encapsulate the experience for many people. And the, the best thing about this book for me, as I'd kind of mentioned previously about being able to look forward, is that, um, and, and similar to what someone had commented about, we, we, we still women, and that's probably a fear of aging for, we're, you know, we're told it's not a good thing to age and to go through these transitions, but, you know, you, you think the worst of them, because that is the single story that we've been told about menopause. And it brought me back to a time when my, I was trying to, to wean or actually get this third child who made this comment about menopause um, to sleep in her own bed. And I was stewing, this was baby number three. I know better, I know I shouldn't be, you know, having her in my bed and breastfeeding her to sleep. And she's way too old to be there. And I was just beside myself fretting in the dance studio. And there was another mother there. And I, and I was, you know, so I have to do it tonight. Like tonight's the night, I'm not gonna sleep for the next week. It's gonna be horrible. And, it's blah, 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 blah. and I was kind of going off. And then she just looked at me and she said, or maybe it won't. And in that moment, I was like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe it won't be, maybe it won't be this, this horrible thing. And that's what this book has done for me. It, it's showed me that maybe it won't be horrible. Um, you know, I've, I've learned that the transition can be messy and funny and horrible and unpredictable, but that it also can be joyful. And though it can be a time of grief and sorrow, it can be also a time of reinvention, creation, renewal, and repositioning. And that doesn't sound very unwoman to me. Um, it sounds like, I, I think we've all given a big middle finger to those yeah. white guys who, yeah. who told us what we, what we were becoming. Yeah. And I, I just, that doesn't sound like the end of anything that to me sounds like the beginning. So thank you to the contributors. 
um, really beautiful, stunning, engaging, and such uh, vast opinions and perspectives on menopause and to our fabulous editors and Demeter Press and Yvonne for curating uh, the technical aspects of it. And you can order the book through Al's, Al's, Al's Nest Book Club in Calgary and Laughing Oyster Bookshop in Courtney, BC, as well as from Demeter Press. And thank you to the readers all of our 24 contributors across 18 chapters. Fantastic. And, and that concludes our launch. So again, one more final parting shot of the book, brilliant, um, adding to the new narrative of uh, what the transition is all about. So thank you everyone, thank uh, you have a wonderful night and go pick up the book. Cheers. Thank you.